This is a rude screen, or is it? What about this? Or this? Rude screens, the barrier which separates the altar area from the nave, are extremely ancient and appear essentially as soon as church buildings. The first recorded instances are railings of wood or bronze that stretched across the church and divided the area set aside for the altar from that set aside for the people. The Church of the Apostles, erected by the Emperor Constantine in 4th century Constantinople, had its sanctuary divided by what it described as a reticulated screen of gilded bronze, while the Church of Tyre, built by Bishop Paulinus, had an altar surrounded by cancellus ex ligno fabricatus, that is, by wooden railings. The reason for this is given by St Germanus, the Patriarch of Constantinople, who speaks of the Holy of Holies in the temple being accessible only to priests and being fenced off by bronze railings. In the same way, the church building is divided into the Holy of Holies, accessible only to priests serving at the altar. Those examples which managed to survive from this period take the form of often petite and well-proportioned colonnades, faintly reminiscing of something built by, by Palladio. They are immediately in front of the altar and are built of slender marble columns set on a balustrade. The colonnade is slightly later in development, but is essentially an extrapolation of the original theme. The probable reason for the addition of columns is that a curtain was run across the screen to shroud the altar from the nave during penitential seasons such as Lent or Advent. However, a side effect of this was that it allowed a series of candlesticks and a large crucifix to be affixed to the top. The placement of lights on the screen was an important practical step to light the church. But it is the crucifix, or in Old English the rood, spelt R-O-O-D, later flanked by statues of the Blessed Virgin and St John, that gives the name to the rood screen. Such an arrangement was known to be in use in the Old St Peter's in Rome in early times, and we have a record that the figures were all of silver. As the basilican model of the church began to evolve, the area immediately in front of the colonnade became set aside for priests, and was often enclosed by its own low balustrade, which formed what is called the presbytery, the enclosed area with seating, forming a distinct liturgical space in itself, and set aside for the recitation of the hours and for other monastic and collegiate services. It is at this point that a slightly confusing step seems to have been taken. In many churches, a further screen seems to have been installed directly to, to the west of this pre presbytery enclosure, which also held lights. Slowly, the entire apparatus of the original screen in front of the altar made its transition over to this beam. Initially, it doesn't seem to have been clear to the architects that the original crucifix over the altar screen could simply be transposed onto this new screen, and often a whole new beam was installed over the new screen to hold the crucifix. The reasons behind this are unfortunately lost in the mists of time, but there are several examples of this strange arrangement caught in the act of transition. Most prominently here in Torcello Cathedral, where you can see the new choir screen below the transposed rood beam. Let me be clear here, there was never two screens there was either a screen before the altar fronted by an enclosure for the clergy to sit in, the presbytery, or there was a screen in front of the presbytery with a rude beam above it. Inevitably, before long, the beam and the screen became one discrete unit, though it's important to bear in mind this distinction, because it will come back to haunt and confuse us later on in this video. The earliest rude screens in England were made of stone and were attempts and this is a point of much confusion, to imitate the continental colonnaded screens. They occur in the earliest English churches which we have the remains of, and often, though not always, seem to have been formed of a low arch or three low arches across the nave of the church. To be clear, 
These triple chancel arches of the earliest Anglo-Saxon churches are nothing but a deliberate attempt to reproduce more or less faithfully, and as the material and skill served, such colonnaded screens as those of old St Peter's in Rome. These triple up chancel arches occur very frequently and in the earliest churches that we have left from the 7th century, and remains of them have been found in the church of Culver. Reculver is a fascinating archaeological survival, and it seems that the arches rest upon pre-used Roman columns, but this was by no means normal. It's at this point that the second confusing and surprising thing happens. These arches are not, in fact, the origin of the modern rood screen. They are actually the origin of the chancel arch. As church architecture again evolved, somewhat divergently from the continental model, they're greatly informed by the churches in Gaul, the three arches became one long arch and became taller and taller until eventually it reached the roof of the building and became an architectural feature, integral to the structure itself. The rood beam, the bar of wood spanning the church and topped by the candles and the cross, became again detached and was shunted higher and higher until eventually it was swapped and placed beneath the arch. Reproducing the continental model, these arches often had one or two distinct pulpits directly to the west. We can say with some certainty that in the early medieval period, many churches had screens and pulpits which were of this type, with a single masonry arch, a railing below and a beam above. Canterbury Cathedral had one of this type, and there is also evidence of one having existed at, at Bury St Edmunds, with the rood donated by Archbishop Stigand. William of Malmesbury references another such arrangement when he tells us that at Winchester, a flash of lightning, Trabum maximum peculiate, ut fragmena in tota spargerento, Ecclesia, quinet crucifixi caput condextra tibi et imagium sancti Maria de Jacet. That is, it broke up the rood beam, splintering the image of our Lord, and hurling down that of the Blessed Virgin. This was on the 15th of October 1091. There are two last points to note here, which is that part of the screen's function continued to be to hold a curtain, which was drawn across either at penitential times or to veil the altar at certain parts of the Mass. An Anglo-Saxon pontifical tells us that extenso velo interior sed populum, that a veil was stretched between the priest and the people. This implies that when veils were not stretched around the altar, as was common on the continent, and is the primary function of the Roman Valdicino, they were placed across the screen. The second point is that these beams do not appear to hold a platform or rood loft. It is true that in some of the southern continental churches, a beam was stretched between two pulpits, which sometimes gave the impression that this is the origin of the rood loft. But in fact, it is simply a remnant of the original function of the screen separating the presbytery, which often was flanked at its west end by two pulpits. As we shall see, the two pulpit model has a quite separate lineage to that of the rood screen. At this point, I'm going to talk only about big cathedrals and collegiate churches, and then we will look in some more detail about how smaller parish churches copy the standards set by their mother churches as best they could. I have already mentioned three distinct features of evolving church architecture, the chancel arch, which is now a single span architectural feature, which we will leave for now. Second, the rude beam with a rail below and depending on the width of the nave, some supporting wooden columns to prevent it sagging in the middle. Third, the two pulpits customarily placed at the west end of the presbytery and sometimes connected with a rude beam in the southern continental churches. Let's look first at the last of these features. In England and France, these grew into what we will call the pulpitum, 
In a slightly confused process, they expanded into essentially a single large block placed to the west of the chancel arch. Sometimes these held the rude beams well, as at Westminster Abbey, and sometimes not, as at Salisbury, where a pulpitum was erected directly to the west of the chancel arch, now the chancel crossing with a tower on top. The reason behind this seems to have been general conventions surrounding the placement of the presbytery as it relates to the chancel arch. This is by no means a hard and fast rule, but in those churches where the presbytery extended to the west beyond the chancel arch or crossing, a pulpitum was the norm. And in those churches where the presbytery ended at the chancel arch in a rood screen, a separate pulpit was constructed to the west of the central crossing, preserving the general convention of the ancient churches to place pulpits to the west of a rood beam. In fact, there are examples of this again being caught in the act of transition. An example is the screen at Dunstable which seems to have been an ancient pulpitum and to have been transformed into a rood screen during the eastward expansion of the building. Again, however, we have to caveat this with the fact that there are so many hybrid examples of pulpitum screens, which buck the general trend. In these, however, there is still a degree of uniformity. The screen here is normally a solid wall, like a pulpitum, with a little doorway on either side, such as in St Albans. This allows for a central nave altar and for two columns of monks to follow the line of coloured stones helpfully laid down the centre of the nave and in procession through the screen. This may go some way to explaining why this format was particularly favoured in monastic foundations. I hope that all of these exceptions to the rule are proving an important point for this period of church appointment that while there was a general notion of separation by a screen and a rood cross, the clear distinction between the rood screen and the pulpitum was not yet, as it had not yet been in the early Italian churches, a hard and fast one. There is a final spanner to throw in the works here, which is the notion of the fence screen. Sometimes, for example, at a uh, Nor Norwich Cathedral, for example, a further screen was added to the west of the pulpitum. The rites of Durham talk about such screens in front, note in front of the nave altar. The height, we are told, was something above a man's breast, and in height of the said door, it was all over stricken full of iron pipes that no man should climb over it. The function of these screens is obvious, and I won't say any more about them except to know that they existed, and that they shouldn't be confused, as they sometimes are, with the actual rood screen or with the pulpitum. So, we are left with an image in our minds of what one may have encountered as one entered what was considered to be an optimum liturgical space. As you enter, and you make your way up through the nave, you will approach a nave altar, but will find your way blocked by a spiky fence which prevents you and the rest of the crowd getting too close. Behind the nave altar is the pulpitum, a large stone screen spanning the whole width of the central aisle, with a platform on top, derived from the early pulpits of the continental churches. In it is probably two small doors, if you are in a monastic building, which lead through the screen to the central crossing. If you make it through these doors, you will find yourself in the central crossing, with the ceiling punctured with the celestry of the tower which has come so far since its origin as a low arch spanning the nave. You will find, however, that despite its height, it is still the custom to hang a curtain called the Great Lenten Veil down the entire height of the arch during penitential seasons, as was done in the ancient times from that low arch. Provided it is not a penitential season, you will be confronted with a rude screen, which does not have a loft, but is surmounted by a large cross and images of St. John and the Blessed Virgin, high enough to be seen clearly over the pulpitum in the nave. Beyond the screen, whose upright supports have now fanned into elegant Gothic tracery, you will see the choir stalls and the high altar, forming their own distinct liturgical space. Between the choir and the area occupied by the altar, 
where the proper liturgical function is the singing of Mass, you will find a step called the step of the choir, which is the last vestigial remains of those separations first built into his churches by the Emperor Constantine. So, now let us imagine that you are not just a time traveller, but a medieval parish priest with pretensions to put his church on the map. What would you have taken from this, and what would you install in your church? The first thing to say is that stone screens were incredibly expensive, much more than most small stone buildings were when all was carved and done. So wood is going to be your building material of choice. Your church already has a chancel arch, and you understand that this is in some albeit distant way inextricably connected with the overall effect. You almost certainly already have a wooden screen of some sort in the church beneath that arch with the crucifix and statues on top. But how can this be improved on? Well, the thing that those churches are missing, which is such an exciting and dramatic part of the cathedral liturgy, is a space high up. You know that in many churches the rood screen and the pulpitum have been conjoined into a single multi-storey unit, and so the parish rood screen with its rood loft is born. But how exactly to use this new rood loft? Not all churches have the means and skill to build such a thing, and there is certainly not a reason for one in the ceremonial. Many, perhaps even most churches, do not have them, and they came into use long after they had been employed in the, in the collegiate and cathedral establishments. In the great churches, they are certainly required for elaborate rituals, but these rituals are highly unlikely to have been used in a parish context. Large parish churches begin to acquire lofts in the 14th century, but they do not trickle down to smaller churches until the 15th century, for example, at Rodney Stoke in Somerset. The width of the loft platforms is generally about six feet, but they vary from as little as five up to eight, and were seen by the parish clergy as enormously practical spaces, not quite in the choir, but also not in the nave. Some screens have projections in the centre of the eastern or western side, or indeed both. Some contain lecterns. These are still left in many churches in France and the Netherlands, and were either movable brass stands like those in the choir, or desks forming part of the overall design. It is tempting to leap straight to the conclusion that these desks were pulpits, intended for the reading of the Gospel, or for preaching. Now it is clear that to a greater or lesser extent, the screens were used to read the Gospel, aping the collegiate church and cathedral practices. In France, the rue screen with the loft is called the Ube, from the first word spoken by the gospeler, Ube Domine Benedicere. The reason why the gospel was read from up high was definitely and finally set down by Pope Innocent III. It is that they who tell good tidings of the gospel should go up on high, as said the prophet Isaiah. Supermontum excelsum excende tu, qui evangelisa sion, exalta et fortitudine voce tuum. However, in many cases, the tiny staircases which lead up to the rude loft obviously prohibit their use by vested priests making their way up from the high altar to the rude loft with a gospel book. Any priest faced with a perilous journey up a narrow spiral staircase crammed into a pillar or turret might be expected to be apprehensive at the best of times, but when fully vested in expensive medieval vestments, certainly cannot be expected to attempt that feat, even when in the prime of life. Now imagine an elderly canon attempting it. In many cases, the steps are so steep that one has to essentially crawl up them, using the treads in front as supports for your hands as your feet feel around for the next step. That is not to say that it was not done in some places where there was more easily accessible stairs and the loft could be more easily reached, but in many places it is obviously absurd. What then explains the presence of the desks in such seemingly inaccessible locations? Well, there are a couple of explanations. Take for example the case of St Stephen Waldbrook, 
where the account records of the parish state that there was a standing lectern for to lay on a book to play with. The playing here is referring to the playing of an organ, and there were many such references, and it seems that such desks were conceived at least in part as architectural features which held the book for an organist, or part books for the village choir, which were often cited in the loft. Another example of this is the account book of 1473 from an Exeter church, which notes seven shillings paid for making a seat in the rood loft when playing on the organs, or in the same rood loft as a pair of organs and a lid over the keys with lock and key, the gift of Borton Wyvis, grocer, and also a stool to sit on when he playeth on the organs. The second explanation is more interesting and more convincingly a general liturgical practice. It seems that the nave altar cited in front of the pulpitum, in collegiate and cathedral churches, in parish churches, took a leap out of the nave proper and up into the rood loft itself. It seems that such altars, often the Jesus altar or the altar of the Holy Cross, fulfilled a similar function to the nave altar in the larger churches as one of the primary places easily visible by all of the people in the nave where the parish mass was regularly celebrated. Such an arrangement complements the increasing medieval desire to see the clearly and distinctly the host being elevated and must have been quite a sight with the priest celebrating before the great rood, flanked by the Virgin and St John, and with the chancel arch rising up above him, often decorated with the Last Judgment. Such a scene to the medieval mind would have encapsulated the entire salvific, salvic economy. This is quite a good explanation, as the priest would vest at the altar, and consequently would be spared the perilous journey up the stairs in full garb. We can see him turning to read the epistle or the gospel from such pulpits, and perhaps, on days when mass was celebrated at the high altar, the musicians would also have made use of it for their books. Such an arrangement was almost certainly in operation in Manchester Cathedral, which has a large 15th century pulpit come rood screen in the central opening and just such protruding reading stand. Indeed, it seems that in some places the altar was actually sited in the protrusion itself or immediately in front of it, allowing either for dramatic effect or for greater space for the movements of the priests. We do in fact get a whisper in surviving descriptions of just such a ritual, with the Gospel at High Mass being read just outside of the rood screen, despite the spacious loft. Long Melford in Suffolk, for example, records in its accounts that, on Good Friday, a priest then standing by the rood screen sang the Passion. This too may have in fact been in order to ape the cathedral practice in some areas, at York Minster there were two chantries at the altar of the Saviour and in the little rood loft, an endowment of the Granthams in the 1349. It gives money for masses in the solario, the rood loft, before the great rood in the midst of the church after the first stroke of the day bell. At Little Hereford in Herefordshire there is a piscina in the loft in a position which would complement a centrally placed altar and such an arrangement is also present at Westminster Abbey. There the altar was dedicated to St Paul, and the whole thing was arranged so that the people could ascend one staircase, kiss the feet of the rood, and go down the other staircase. Of course, there is a final note on this, which is to say that such protruding stands were probably simply fashionable, and would have given the impression of sophistication of ritual to visiting clerics and laity and were, in a sense, the church keeping up with its neighbouring parishes. Like anything from the medieval period, there is a degree of mystery which surrounds the precise nature of the arrangement, but this can largely be put down to a fault on our part rather than to those of our forebears. We are so used in the modern world to being able to explain every last thing by its precise use that we lose sight of the fact that for many of our ancestors, these things were built and done to enrich and in sometimes nebulous ways the fabric and beauty of the service. And why not put an altar in the rood loft? It is the perfect place, high up on the platform so that everybody can see. The evolution of the rood screen is an interesting historical narrative 
but the manner in which it unfolds may have a lot to teach us today.